This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Shortly after the death of his grandfather, Don Decker's life took on a disturbing, almost supernatural dimension. Suddenly, wherever Don was, rain mysteriously began to appear, leaving his friends to wonder if he had somehow been possessed. But for Don Decker, the rain was only the beginning. February 24, 1992, was an unseasonably warm night in the San Francisco Bay Area. For Michael Hunter, it seemed a perfect evening for a motorcycle ride. He had no idea what was waiting for him. When Irene Love was 16, she was startled to learn that she had been adopted. That discovery led to a stunning revelation about Irene's long-lost best friend from childhood. We'll also introduce you to a man who apparently made his living as a professional hospital patient until one of his feigned illnesses turned fatal. It is one of the oddest scams you have ever encountered. Perhaps you can help unravel it on Unsolved Mystery. commit his body to the ground, earth to earth, ashes February to ashes. 24th, 1983, in Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, the funeral of James Kishpaw is in progress. He had died of cirrhosis of the liver at the age of 63. The Lord look upon him with favor and give him peace. His grandson, 21-year-old Don Decker, had been granted a furlough from the county jail to attend the funeral. We would like to invite you to come forward and pay your last respects. Don was serving a four to 12 month sentence for receiving stolen property. It was a capstone of a troubled adolescence. What no one knew was that Don had been keeping a dark secret. He says that his grandfather, James, the man he was now obliged publicly to mourn, had abused him physically from the time he was seven years old. No other part of the family knew anything about, you know, what happened. And uh, it was like, uh, you know, like good fighting evil, I, I basically I put it, you know. Um, the evil was gone, and uh, I was hoping, you know, that everything would change. In fact, things would change, and drastically, but not in a way Don Decker could ever have imagined. After the funeral, Don was completely unnerved by the way his parents glorified his grandfather's memory. He decided to spend the night with his friends, Bob and Jeannie Kiefer, whom he had met a few months earlier. It was at the Kiefer's home that all the uneasy feelings stirred up at his grandfather's funeral came back to haunt Don. Suddenly, the air around him vibrated with a deep chill. Almost simultaneously, water began to drip from the living room walls. Don fell into an eerie, trance-like state. Jeannie? Yeah? Have you got water running back there? No. Come take a look at this. We've got a leak. At a total loss, they decided to notify the landlord, Ron Van Hoy. Get some pots or a bucket or something. I'm going to call Ron. Hi, Ron. This is Bob Keith. The phone rang, and I got a call from my tenant, Bob, 
And he said, uh, you have to come down. We have a problem. And I said, well, what's the problem? He says, well, he says, I can't tell you. He says, just come down. He says, but he says, you have to come down right away. Hey, Bob, what's up? Thanks. We've got a leak here. When Ron arrived, he was just as puzzled as the Kiefer's about the cause of the problem. And look, it's on the walls, too. Sure is. We decided that maybe, it, you know, some plumbing, but there were no pipes in the front end of the house to leak. There was basically nothing there that the water could have come from. It could be some condensation or ice melting or something like that. After watching it for a while, I discovered that it wasn't only coming from the ceiling down. It could come from the wall over or from the floor up. There was no, you know, no basic direction that it was coming from. You know, it could come from anywhere. Ron Van Hoy telephoned his wife, Romaine, and police officer John Bojan. Hey, John, what's going on? Officer Sorry, Bojan John, didn't, didn't know what to make of the strange sure. scene inside the Kiefer house. He brought in his partner, Patrolman Richard Wolbert. I'm not sure I'm seeing what I'm seeing. If you don't tell me what's going on, I'm not going to go in there, John. At this point, he was telling me, I just want you to walk into the house. And I said, well, I'm not walking into the house unless you explain to me what I'm walking into. He says, trust me, trust me, just walk into the house. I walked in the door, and he came right in behind me, and I couldn't have got two steps inside the front door, and I was absolutely pelted. Rich, now you see what I'm talking about. What is this, water? Yeah, it's coming from everywhere. You have a broken pipe? There are no pipes. We were standing just inside the front door, right. and then there's a droplet of water traveling horizontally, and it just passed right between us and just traveled out into the next room. It happens all the time. Unbelievable. And this is only happening in this room. The rest of the house is dry. Come look in the dining room. It's not happening there. I literally had a chill going up my spine. It made me like make the hair stand up on your neck. That's how uh, that's how I felt. This was a situation where things were happening that I never ever dreamed could possibly happen, and there was no way of explaining what was going on. We're gonna get you outside, and we're gonna take it from there. Let's just go outside. Come on. Yeah. I'd like to stick around. At this point, officers Bojan and Wolbert left to report the incident to the police chief. I can't force you to go. While the Kiefer's and Don Decker, who'd gone hours without food, walked across the street to get something to eat, Ron Van Huy and his wife remained behind. They left, and everything else left, too. The rain stopped. The house was normal. Ron, look, it's stopping. We were kind of thinking that maybe it was coming from them. And uh, we weren't sure at that time which one. But uh, we, we kind of figured, you know, because when they left, it left, you know. So we, we were sure it was had something to do with one of them. It had now been 23 hours since the mysterious rain began. Pam Scrofano, who owned the restaurant opposite the Kiefer's house, had visited them earlier that day and seen the rain firsthand. Worse than this morning? Yes. Pam was convinced it was the devil's handiwork and that the devil was acting through Don Decker. No, 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 you should probably call the church. Have the priest come over and take a look at me. You're looking at Donnie, and he was like in a trance. You know, he, he would look at you, but not knowing that you were there. I said to Jeannie, I said, you know, he's got to be possessed. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. We sit in there. This is what A couple the seconds the later, there's last water last all over the pizzeria, you too. Have, you have a crucifix? Hey. You have a crucifix? No, I've never seen anything like that happen in my life. So I went in the cash register. I had a crucifix there. I took it out, put it on him. And the minute, you know, I put it on him, touched the skin, and he got burned. It burned. Just leave Cross it out. burned leave him, out. and it turned well, black. This boy is possessed. You have to call, you have to call the church. You have to have the priest come and look at him. Okay. I'm going back to the house to wait for the police. There's no way that anybody could have played a, you know, a joke like that. This was real. Donnie was doing it himself. And he was doing it without realizing it that he was doing it. To take him to the church and have the priest come look at him, that's what you should do. We'll call give me a call, give me we'll a call. call. Even Don Decker had begun to believe that he was somehow responsible. The rain in the restaurant was the final straw. And now it's stopping. It made me more sure that I was, had something to do with it because it was following me. And it didn't start raining in the house until I got there. They were living there. Nothing ever happened. And that's when I started realizing that that was me. It's not a coincidence. They think it's him. I don't buy it. 
could. This is horrible. Back at the Kiefer's house, Romaine Van Huy confronted Don Decker, accusing him of somehow causing all the trouble on purpose. This is your fault. You made it rain in the living room. You made it rain at Pep's place. This is all your fault. It's you, Donnie. You're the one that's doing this, and you have to make it stop. It got pots and pans that were over the stove. They started rattling. That's when I got levitated off the floor. I was just like floating. Donnie. Then it was like a push, but um. It wasn't like somebody taking your hand and pushing you. It was like feeling it all over your body at one. And I'm a big guy, you know? You know, I always have been assertive and that made, made me felt like a newborn, <laughs> you know? Um, uh, I, I'm, I'm scared right now just talking about it, really. But. I believe that there was a, a I don't know if you'd call it an evil spirit, but whatever, a demon, you know, possessed his body and uh, caused this, I, I, you know. Well, this better be good, gentlemen. You wake me up in the middle of the night, I'm out here. A few here hours after the strange person incident person in the kitchen, officers Bo Jen and Wolbert arrived with their chief, a hardened skeptic in tow. I got a 7 o'clock meeting with the mayor tomorrow morning. When the chief got to the house, he was pelted with weather, just as Rich and I was. It's getting worse. I got the impression that he was put on the spot, maybe a little bit embarrassed, like we expected something out of him that he could answer. This looks like a problem with your pipes. There was no way to explain what happened, and I think he was put in a position where he might have felt a little uncomfortable. Try as a bone on the other side of the house. The Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania chief of police would be one of the only eyewitnesses from that bizarre night who denied that anything out of the ordinary had happened. You got me out of bed for this? Hey, chief, this isn't a police problem. This is a plumbing problem. This is a police problem. These people are helpless. These people are having a joke with you. They're having their way with you. Look, nobody's being hurt here. Nobody's being threatened, so we're out of here. We'll talk about it outside. OK. All right, don't worry. We'll take care of it. The police chief ordered his officers to leave the Kiefer house. He instructed them not to file a report. In fact, he directed them not to speak of the incident at all. I think he just wanted out. He could not uh, give us an explanation for it. He couldn't help us. He couldn't provide us with anything more than what we had, you know, we had experienced and what we had come up with. Well, he just flat out denied it. It didn't happen. And he tried to convince me that nothing happened. And he wasn't going to do that. I saw it, and that's all there is to it. The next day, acting against the specific orders of the police chief, three of his veteran officers went to the Kiefer home to try and figure out what was going on. You'll be all right. All right. Nice and loose. One of the officers was Bill Davies. All right. This will just take a second. Hey, bring your hands behind your back. We're standing there, and I gave Mr. Decker this gold cross to hold. Just hold on to that for a minute. The next thing is, it's burning my hands. It burns. And there's no explanation for it. When you picked it up, when you grabbed it, not hot, hot, but it's hot. And that's when I, and I held on to it. Hey, what's going on here? Hey, guys. Oh, no. he the rain here now. All of a sudden, he lifted up off the ground, and he flew across the room with the force of though a bus had hit him. Donnie. We looked, and uh, right? there was three claw marks on the side of his neck. It was drew blood. My God, look at this neck. Come on. I have no answer for it whatsoever. And <clears throat> I just draw a blank, even to today. I've been a cop 40 years, and I never ran anything like this here. Never. I mean, there's always an explanation when something happens. If you got investigated, you come up with something. This is why it happened. This case here, there is no explanation. Evil upon this house. Finally, on the third night, Ron Van Huy was able to convince an evangelical preacher, whom we will call Reverend Johnson, to come to the house and attempt an exorcism. We all must kneel and pray. Every Protestant minister and Catholic priest in Stroudsburg had turned Ron down. The Van Huys and the Kiefers kept vigil while Reverend Johnson prayed for Don. Our Father, who art in heaven. As she started to pray, Donnie went into uh, like a, a convulsion, you know, he, he started to shake. Uh, he pulled himself up into like a ball 
And uh, the longer she prayed, he started to relax then. His whole body seemed to quiet completely down. And as you're standing there watching this, you could feel the house itself seemed to take on a total different feeling. Trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. And by the time she got done praying, uh, the water was gone. And that was the last that we saw of any water at the house at all. Amazingly, the rain had stopped. Don Decker appeared to return to his old self. Some witnesses believe that Reverend Johnson had performed a miracle or an exorcism, but whatever it was, the results would prove to be only fleeting. After his furlough, Don Decker returned to the Monroe County Jail. Within a few days, the mysterious rain had once again materialized. Guard! Guard! Get me out of here! What's the problem here? Look at me. I'm soaking wet. It's all wet. Now get me Drake, out of here! Great. can you get him out of here? They put me in a maximum security cell. And I was in there with a, another hey, inmate. And uh, I was thinking, you know, Smith, you I wish to make it rain in here. And all of a sudden, water just started coming out of a concrete floor. And uh, at that point, um, I thought I could do stuff. What are you doing? You're throwing water under the cell walls from the sink or from the toilet or something? Huh? I can control it. This time it was different. This time Don felt powerful. He realized he could manipulate the rain at will. You could control the rain. I tell you what, if you can control the rain, make it rain in the warden's office. Make it rain in, in, in Dave Keenhold's office. I was sitting at the desk and I was writing a report. I was all by myself in the administration area. Nobody else was around. It was approximately 8 o'clock in the evening. At the time, I didn't feel anything. My shirt was drooping down. Yeah, come in. Excuse me, Warden. I was just down talking to you. I didn't know what was going on, and the officer told me to look at my shirt. It's a brand new shirt. And right here on about the center of my sternum, about four inches long, two inches wide, I was just saturated with water. And he said he could make it. I was startled. I was scared, so was the officer. The officer was very frightened at that particular time. And I just didn't have an explanation of why it happened. All of a sudden, I, I received this uh, frantic call from a sergeant in the jail. His name is Keenhold. And he said, uh, can you come over? We need you. We need your help. Reverend Blackburn, nice to meet you. Sit down, please. Thank you, officer. We'll be fine. So they brought this very meek, mild, mannered young man into the room. And he was asking my help. What is it here? What's going on? I can make it rain. They put a cross around my neck and it burned. Rosary in my hand and it burned. Son, don't you think it would be a lot simpler if you just stopped all this nonsense right now? You're making all this up, aren't you? All of a sudden, like that, demeanor changed and the smell came into the room uh, nurses and doctors medical people will tell you that when you walk into a room where someone is dying with a cancer or something usually there's a smell you can tell when you walk in a room and I smelled a smell like that multiplied five times at least evil foreboding um, I have powers you don't I can make it rain. And at that point, he raised his hand and he rubbed his fingers together. And all of a sudden, it started to rain. It was like the devil's rain. It was a mist. I was in the presence of evil. I'm going to pray for you. I don't want you to pray for me. I don't care whether you want me to or not. Prayer is my prerogative. And I opened up the Bible and started to read to him. But the pages never got wet. From the day so help me, it was a frightening thing. Your wickedness was found in you. Through your widespread trade, you were filled with violence. I think I was praying more for me than it was for him. I prayed, and, I, and it was only a brief period, and the rain stopped. I bind you in the name of Jesus Christ. He subsided, and you could feel a peace. 
He said, thank you. It's gonna be he got right. tears in his eyes, and we hugged, and we prayed together. It's going to be all right. He was possessed. There's no doubt in my mind. There is no way that a human being could do what he did in that room. There's no way that he did anything but what he did was spiritual. And it wasn't of God. Guaranteed it was not of God. Well, it's over, and it hasn't happened again. So um, basically, I'm just hoping that it never will. And uh, I just, you know, go day by day. And uh, as for my grandfather, um, I think what had happened it was his doing. Because he abused me when I was young, he got a chance to abuse me again. I think what makes this case very unique is that all of the witnesses are so credible. We're dealing with very good, well-seasoned police officers that were obviously rather frightened and shaken by this, but also had the powers of observation. Chip Decker, no relation to Don, and Peter Jordan are the principal paranormal researchers on this case. They believe that somewhere there is information as yet undiscovered which may help them unravel this mystery. The Donald Decker case, the Rain Boy case, is by far the singularly most fascinating and important case I have ever personally been involved in. That does not mean that I believe that it necessarily is proof positive to me of demonic infestation, but is the case in my own personal experience up to this point that comes the closest to that hypothesis. What happened to Don Decker? In all nine eyewitnesses, 10, counting Don himself, are willing to go on public record claiming they saw, heard, and felt phenomena apparently not of this world. Is it possible that Don Decker, somehow mesmerized by the pain of a childhood trauma, stumbled into another world which none of us can fathom? Or was Don Decker perhaps trapped in some murky region of his own psyche, his power to do good and his power to do evil, locked in combat with Don's own body as a battlefield? After all, as John Milton wrote in Paradise Lost, the mind is its own place, and in itself can make a heaven of hell, a hell of heaven. Next, a champion motorcycle racer is gunned down in an apparent robbery turned lethal. The shimmering lights of San Francisco Bay can be seen from more than a dozen surrounding communities. On the evening of February 24, 1992, one of those communities became the scene of a tragic, unsolved murder. At 8.33 p.m., a man slowly approached a gas station in Emeryville, across the bay from San Francisco. He was hunched over his motorcycle, weaving in an erratic and perilous fashion. Police and paramedics were dispatched to the scene and attempted to revive the stricken rider. Just give me a ventilation. Give me another one. OK, continue compression. Let's get that back one over here. Let's get him out of here. His pulse was feeble, and he was barely alive. Okay, let's check his back. The absence of any external injuries left the authorities mystified. One, two, three. There was no bleeding at all at the site. Um, if it had been a reported motorcycle accident or some kind of an accident, you would expect to see some kind of blood. But there was absolutely none. OK, back over. One, two, three. The unknown motorcyclist was rushed to a nearby hospital. It was later discovered that he had been shot three times by a small caliber weapon. One, two, three. One of the bullets had shattered his knee. A second had lodged in his abdomen. The third and fatal bullet had punctured his aorta. The wounds were nearly invisible, but had resulted in massive internal bleeding. The victim never regained consciousness and was pronounced dead shortly after 9 p.m. The victim was later identified as 30-year-old Michael Hunter, an avid motorcycle racer who had survived hundreds of dangerous competitions only to perish on a lonely Bayfront road. What happened to Michael Hunter is unfortunately an all-too-common occurrence in today's big cities. 
An innocent person is murdered. The killer walks away. The police are left without a suspect or a motive. Even in the highly competitive field of motorcycle racing, Michael Hunter was known as a man with no enemies. He lived for one thing and one thing only, high-speed racing. During the mid-1980s, Michael Hunter suited up for competitions throughout California, earning a reputation as one of the area's top cyclists. He said that racing gave him probably the highest high that he'd ever had in his whole life. He said if there was nothing that beat this excitement and the thrill of, of, of the racing. And I think the competition was maybe almost incidental to the, the thrill of the, the racing. He was always sharing, always teaching. Mike took me in hand from the beginning and taught me how to ride, taught me how to ride safely. He taught me how to ride uh, clean. The evening of February 24th began like many others for Michael Hunter. At 7.45 p.m., he climbed aboard his red, white, and blue sport bike, apparently just to go for a ride. February 24th was a beautiful evening. It was almost like a summer night. Crystal clear, no breeze. It, it was just, uh, it was very pleasant to be out in. A few minutes after Michael left home, he stopped off at an ATM half a mile away. As he withdrew $20 from his checking account, a security camera in the ATM recorded the transaction. From the photographs that we have, it would appear to be an uneventful withdrawal. So we don't have any reason to think that he was robbed or shot at the um, ATM machine. Michael next showed up at a liquor store half a block from the ATM. There he purchased the pint of whiskey, which was later found in his jacket pocket. What happened next is pure conjecture. The police believe that Michael may have headed to a frontage road three miles from the gas station, known for its breathtaking view of the Bay Bridge. It was here, while enjoying the fresh winter breeze, that Michael Hunter may have encountered his killer or killers. The police theorize that someone may have robbed Michael of his wallet at gunpoint and then demanded his motorcycle, a customized Honda VFR Interceptor sport bike. Probably Mike's love of his motorcycle would cause him to be reluctant to turn it over. Michael apparently tried to outrun the bullets. It was a race he had no chance of winning. I think that he was probably pretty scared, and I, I like to think, I, I really like to believe that he didn't know what was going on. It would have taken him a long time to get to that station. That's not a short stint to ride when you're hurt. Michael had very few minutes to live after he was shot. The bullet that shattered his leg would have caused him to be in a great deal of pain. And it was his past experience and training that enabled Michael to make the ride into the gas station where he knew there would be some kind of help there for him. An hour later, Michael Hunter was dead, leaving his family to wonder who killed him and why. I think all the time he raced, I knew that something could happen to him because he was living beyond what most people do as far as is what he chose to do for his recreation. Had he died that way, it was a choice he would made and a conscious choice he'd made. And I think that it would have been a lot easier to accept. There's just no information coming our way uh, about a person that was uh, on a red, white, and blue motorcycle dressed the same kind of way, obviously very noticeable, 
I believe that somebody saw Michael Hunter in the last 40 minutes of his life. And we need those people to come forward to tell us that little piece of information that will identify the killers of Michael Hunter. Michael Hunter's friends and family have raised a $10,000 reward for information which may help solve this case. When we return, a nationwide search for the true identity of a hospital hopping con man. Just before 9 a.m. on February 11, 1992, the emergency team at a Danbury, Connecticut hospital springs into action. The patient, a man registered as Tom Hughes, is in the grip of a severe cardiac arrest. For 90 minutes, doctors and nurses labor to revive him. However, all their efforts are in vain. At 1020, the man known as Tom Hughes is pronounced dead. George. When the hospital dutifully attempted to contact the man's wife, they discovered that her name and phone number were bogus. So were the patient's social security number, address, occupation, and employer. Tom Hughes simply did not exist. Among the man's possessions were a receipt from a hospital in California and a bus ticket stub from Pennsylvania to Connecticut. Starting with these meager clues, authorities soon uncovered a peculiar fraud scheme. Until he died, the man known as Tom Hughes had essentially been a professional hospital patient. It was a scam that may have killed him. this happened while you were working? Yes, I was helping my brother do some work on a house he's buying over in Ridgefield. The con man would stay in a hospital for three to seven days before sneaking out and leaving his bills unpaid. And the next thing I know... Uh, it appears that Tom would check into a hospital with some sort of small self-inflicted wound and uh, have a complaint of a lower back pain. We think that he was checking himself into the hospitals to obtain the pain pills. Okay, well, I'm going to prescribe something a bit stronger, and I'd like to suggest that you check yourself in for observation for a few days. Any objection? Well, whatever you say. You're the doctor. Okay. We were able to determine that Tom had essentially been traveling across the country and staying in one hospital after another and taking a bus from uh, uh, one destination to another. We were able to track him from uh, California all the way to Rhode Island and points in between. Yes, my name is uh, Thomas Hughes. I need to speak with someone about a personal injury case. The con man had made 16 calls before he died. I'm a civil engineer. Yeah, firm in West. Investigators traced them, hoping to locate friends or family members. Instead, they uncovered yet another facet of his unusual scheme. Every single call had been made to an attorney. In fact, we I think he called the attorneys with a story that he wanted to have a lawsuit because of his uh, injuries uh, at work. So but uh, I think the real reason he called the attorneys was to, again, tell a story to someone and uh, borrow some money. He needed travel money, and uh, he would obtain this by borrowing small amounts from the attorneys. Oh, listen, I, I hate to ask you this. Uh, would you do me a favor? Sure. Well, I'm expecting a package for my wife today. It's coming COD. Could I borrow $40 until tomorrow? Well, yeah, I guess I could do that. I'll just uh, add it to my bill. <laughs> okay. Uh, $40? We know that Tom had been traveling from hospital to hospital for a year, two years, or possibly longer, and each time taking uh, excessive amounts of uh, painkillers. And uh, we believe that uh, could be a contributing cause of, uh, of his death. This photograph of the unidentified man was taken just hours before his death. He weighed 277 pounds, although authorities cautioned that he may have put on much of the weight since he began living in hospital beds.
Next, a woman needs your help to find a childhood friend who turned out to be much more than just a friend. Most of us have read Alice in Wonderland and pondered what it might feel like to fall through the looking glass into a place where nothing was quite as it seemed. For a Los Angeles woman named Irene Love, the looking glass was an old strong box harboring her mother Minnie's private papers. Once Irene opened it, her parents and her best friend turned out not to be at all what they seemed. Nineteen sixty two, mid city Los Angeles. Sixteen year old Irene Love was killing a Saturday afternoon in her mother's bedroom. I used to play music a lot, my records. I would sometimes even go through my mother's drawers and just be nosy. I've always been nosy. I looked around and there was a metal box. I opened it up and there were some papers that were dating nineteen forty two. And I thought, God, mom keeps this. Then there was another piece of paper folded up, and it was a birth certificate. And it had Irene Wynn on it. And I go, hmm, same first name as mine. Then I noticed the father's name was Glenn, mother's name was Ramona, County General Hospital, the date. I said, well, the date, that was what caught me. The date was the same date as my birth. And uh, by that time, a little bit later on, my mother came home. Honey, I'm home. What are you doing in here? Look what I found. What's that? And I showed her the paper. Where'd you find this? Over there. What are you doing snooping through my things? You know those are private papers. Are you my real mother? Irene, I love you so much. And it came to life that I was adopted, and she and my dad had adopted me uh, three days after I was born. And she was fearful that I was going to, at that point, leave and go and search for my real parents. And I told her, no, I wasn't, I just wanted to know what was the story about it. Minnie and Forrest Love had brought Irene home on June 3rd, 1946. Oh, we're home, Irene. We're really home. Honey, why she cry? She's fine, honey. They could not have children of their own, so Minnie and Forrest were especially thrilled with their new daughter. Look at that baby. You know. They provided her with everything, even a best friend. Dolores Ford, just one year older than Irene, was the only child of Minnie and Forrest's best friends. They would bring her over every day or every weekend. We went on camping trips. We went to the park. We went everywhere to the lakes. We never really argued. It was like we, we knew each other. We connected. Um, if one wanted something, the other one knew about it, and it was always there. We were just connected so close that there was like a great friendship there. Every holiday, they would come over and bring the gifts, and we exchanged gifts there in the living room. It was basically, we got the same toys, so they didn't deny us anything. They made sure that we were happy kids. <laughs> Merry Christmas, baby. <laughs> I don't think a child in this world has had a better childhood than I have because I had my, my mom, my dad, I had Billy and Ford that were just like my mother and father. I had Dolores. We just had a we just had a fun time. They they occupied every minute of our lives when we were children together. And that was fun times. Is there anything else you should tell me? Well, honey, you remember. That day in 1962, Minnie asked Irene to think back to her happy childhood. She asked her to recall a restaurant, Clifton's, where Minnie and Forrest had taken Irene every Sunday. Now Minnie explained why they had always gone to the same place. Irene's birth mother, Ramona, who was Hispanic, worked at the cafeteria. This was her only opportunity to watch Irene grow up. Don't look at me. 
At some point, Eileen's birth father, Glenn, began to work at Clifton's too. Minnie and Forrest would alternate their seating locations in the restaurant, so both Glenn and Ramona could see the daughter they had been too poverty-stricken to raise themselves. What's the name of this play? Caught the Butterfly. And she's Madam Butterfly. Mm -hmm. That's nice. <laughs> I never faulted them for what they did. They had to do what they had to do. And I'm thankful that they gave me to a family, to the family that they did give me to. So that's, you know, I was lucky in that way. Irene and Dolores and their parents lived happily until 1956. Then Dolores's mother, Billy, died of a kidney disease. Suddenly, Dolores seemed to vanish into thin air. Irene never saw her again. Only years later, when Irene's mother finally told her the truth, did Irene learn what had happened to her friend. Okay, come on, let's go. Shortly after Dolores' mother died, her father came to the sad conclusion that he could no longer raise her alone, that she needed a mother. Dolores, this is Ramona. Hi, Dolores. He took Dolores to live with Glenn and Ramona, the couple who worked at Clifton's cafeteria. I'll take that. But why? Finally, the shocking news came out. Dolores was also the child of Glenn and Ramona Wynn. Dolores and Irene were sisters. Irene was thunderstruck. Her mother explained apologetically that she had been afraid to let Irene continue seeing Dolores after Dolores moved in with Ramona and Glenn. I was afraid if I told you the truth that I would lose you. No matter what, you'll always be my mother. In 1989, after both of her parents passed away, Irene found herself irresistibly drawn back to the old neighborhood, reliving her happy childhood with Dolores. And in my mind, I can see us playing together. H-O-T, get on this side of the road now. Here we go now. Fudge, fudge, tell the judge, mama's got a newborn baby. We were like twins, you know, but not knowing that we were sisters, you know. And so that's what I want real bad to meet with her. She's a part of my early life. She's a part of me. I feel things that... I don't think anybody else could feel right now because it's like an emptiness that's going on inside of me due to the fact I don't know where she's at. And I hope one day soon that we can come together and be the silly little girls that we were when we were growing up. Because I'm still a silly little girl in heart and I want to I wanna be with her as soon as possible. Irene also has a message for her birth parents, Glenn and Ramona Wynn who watched so lovingly from a distance while she grew up. Ramona and Glenn, I want to get to know you also and, and bring you back into my life. I don't have any anger. I believe you did what you had to do. And I love you. Just, if you're out there listening, please call me. I want to hear from you also. Today, Glenn and Ramona Wynn would be 72 and 67 years old, respectively. They divorced in the 50s, and Ramona, whose maiden name was Via, married a man named Richards or Richardson, with whom she also had children. These are two of the last known photographs of Dolores Ford. In 1956, when she was 10, Dolores moved to Second Street in downtown Los Angeles to live with Glenn and Ramona Wynn. This July, Dolores will be 48 years old, her last known address was also in the Los Angeles area. Join me again next week. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. Thank you.